Dr Susan Newman who will introduce the discussion and then we're going to have a QA. and a um, So if you could send your questions to the Q&A panel at the bottom of the uh, your screens um, and we'll answer them at the end. So we'll start with Michael um, who's worked as an economist, eco economist in the City of London for over 30 years and is the author of The Great Recession, A Marxist View and most recently The Long Depression. So if you want to start. Thank you Lucy. Um, now somewhat retired and locked down in the south of England so uh, uh, this is a quieter environment in which we can discuss this rather, well, how can we call it? Uh, the usual media uh, phrase is unprecedented uh, development we've seen with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. And a few minutes I've got available, I'd just like to share with you a few graphs so that we can take the story as I see it through with a bit of visual. So bear with me if I get this right. Uh, Let's get to the front, sorry. Yep, okay. So, first wanna deal with the uh, virus itself. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about the uh, nature of the virus, where it came from, uh, how virulent it is and how it spread. We now know something about it. There's been a lot of pathogens over the last few years, which have been transmitted through wild animals into other animals and then into human beings. These pathogens have spread into human beings for which we have no immunity, although the wild animals do, because of the massive spread of human urbanization, logging, fossil fuel exploration, generally the huge global expansion of cap capitalism's drive to industrialize, urbanize, and use up nature's resources. That's brought us very close to to nature and to wild animals who've been holding these pathogens for a long time. In this particular case, it seems to have come probably through bats into another animal, farm animal or wildlife animals held in markets in China. And then from there, through human transmission to the rest of the world. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is this a really dangerous pathogen, a dangerous uh, virus? I mean, there's a lot of discussion going around on the social media, amongst the left as well as the right, that actually it's no worse than flu, and really this is a fuss about nothing. Well, first thing you have to say is that it is much more dangerous than flu. First of all, its transmission rate, which is the top thing in that graph, the RO number is much, much higher than it is with flu, uh, if there's no containment, the incubation time is a lot longer, which means you don't notice you've got it or it builds up in a number of human beings and makes them ill before um, you can do anything about it. Symptoms take place much later. The hospitalization rate is much higher because when it affects people, particularly as we now know, old people and generally sick people, you get a massive increase in hospitalization, which is the big issue for the lockdowns. And then the issue which is continually debated is the fatality rate. Not the case fatality rate, but the fatality rate likely in the whole population. As far as the latest data shows, it looks as though it's somewhere between 0.6 and 1% of the world's population uh, could die from this if there was no attempt to control the transmission. That's six to 10 times more deadly than annual flu. So contrary to the view that it's no worse than flu, that so far, the evidence shows that that's absolutely wrong. It is way, way worse, both in its spread and in, in its deadly uh, feature. Indeed, uh, here's a little graph which shows, um, if you can follow this, that if there was no containment whatsoever of the virus, no control over transmission whatsoever, then if you had a 70% of the population infected with a 1% mortality rate, that would mean 50 million deaths uh, globally if there was no attempt to control the virus and you just let it spread towards what is called herd immunity, where the point where the virus wanes because enough people have been infected. And if you look at the blue blocks there, that's the normal mortality rate in different countries each year, uh, the rate per thousand of population. If you add in this COVID-19 with no containment, then you add in all that dotted white block as well, so you're nearly doubling the mortality rate that we normally get. And the little red bits is how uh, able countries are 
to control or otherwise uh, this COVID over the last uh, couple of months. You can see that countries like Spain, France and Italy have actually not been able to control it that well and there's been quite an increase towards excess deaths in those countries and of course we have later figures which show that. Well, on the other hand, South Korea, China really have avoided any extra excess deaths on the whole by the methods of mainly, as we'll hope to discuss, um, being prepared. They have had good hospital systems on the whole. In the case of South Korea, Taiwan and a few other countries, they've had plenty of hospital units, plenty of intensive care units. They've had testing, contact and trace. By doing that, they've been able to reduce the transmission and also those people who have to be hospitalized have generally got the facilities and hospital equipment uh, to handle, particularly as they're mostly old and frail and sick, as we've now found out. Uh, our own health minister in the UK claimed that we were well prepared on the 23rd of January. Anybody who sees the data and have followed the information about how well prepared the health system was under the Conservatives realizes that's rubbish, that we haven't got the testing, we haven't got the contact and trace, we had, didn't have enough hospital uh, beds to begin with or ICU units, uh, protective equipment not available to hospital workers, those on the front line. All this was a total failure and also a very slow process towards going to a lockdown uh, in order to control the transmission of the virus. So that's why the UK has a very high rate of deaths and number of, um, per million of population, but also in absolute numbers. Um, because most hospitals and health systems around the world and governments in control of them were not prepared, they took no, they ignored the risks of pandemics, which many international scientific organizations were referring to. They had cut health services to the rhythm, uh, to the ribbon, so that there was no extra capacity to cope with this new virus. Uh, then they were the only possibility of controlling the virus was to try what they call flatten the curve so that health systems weren't overloaded. That means if you did nothing on this graph, that big dark line at the top would tell you the number of people that would get critically ill and die. Uh, if you did some isolation and then some quarantining and then closing the schools, then going to a full lockdown, you can drive the curve down. And that is uh, what most governments have been forced to do rather than having a policy of, con of testing and control in that method and social isolation. They've had to go on for the most dramatic and deep lockdowns in order to try and control this virus. And I say again, this virus is dangerous. Don't think that it's like flu, that if you did nothing, it would just pass away like flu does every year, kill a, a, a few hundred thousand old people. This is way, way worse if it had not been attempted control. Just look at the decisions in London alone, something out of date, but you can see the huge excess deaths that have taken place in London compared to previous years uh, going forward. Uh, and so you can see that if this, if this virus had been allowed to rocket through the UK and elsewhere, then you'd have months and months, days and days of excess deaths. Uh, at the moment, this, this is beginning to come down on the graph, but it will still, at the end of the year, show a significant increase in the number of deaths in 2020 compared to previous years. And I have heard the argument, I hear it now, read it on social media. Look, you see, we didn't need this huge lockdown that's destroying the economy. We could have just had a bit of socialization, isolation, we could have closed down mass events, we could have uh, um, kept, uh, closed the schools and universities, like Sweden has done, a, a light lockdown. And the argument here is that Sweden's succeeding in doing this, uh, and rather than having these heavy lockdowns which are destroying the economy. Well, all I can say is, look at this very latest graph of yesterday, where is Sweden on the list of increases of deaths per million of people? It's way up near the top in Europe. There's no way that you can say Sweden is being more successful than anybody else with its so-called light lockdown. And if you look very closely at the graph, you can see that Sweden is still not peaked. It's still moving up while other countries are beginning to turn downwards uh, through the lockdown. We shall see. But the argument amongst a lot of social media people that Sweden is the way to go and we didn't have the lockdown, it was a plot by capitalism to have a lockdown, it seems to me not based on the science, and it's perhaps something we can discuss in this meeting. The lockdown has now, across the world, stopped what 2.7 billion workers worldwide affected by a lockdown. 81% of the world's workers are now in areas where there are lockdowns. The world economy has never seen anything like this. We're talking about 
a collapse in, in global output of something like 5% according to the IMF, OECD, and so on. This is way worse than the Great Recession. Most economies, while they're in the lockdown, are seeing a reduction in output and in income and employment by 25, 30%, directly affecting most sectors, up to a third of all the sectors in the emerging economies. Um, so even economists say that this collapse, maybe short term, a couple of quarters, maybe not, uh, is going to exceed anything we've seen in the last 150 years in terms of world capitalism. This is a major event for the capitalist economy. And the IMF chief says 170 company, countries are now experiencing, will experience a negative uh, per income <coughs> decline in this year. And what it demonstrates to anybody who thinks about it is that uh, if people don't, if workers don't go to work, nothing gets produced. I mean, this may sound like a simple statement, but you'd be amazed at how many people think that it doesn't, workers don't count in this, uh, in this world. What matters are the people at the top, the chief executives, the politicians, the finance executives, the hedge fund managers, the marketing executives, the real estate uh, executives. I was just thinking the other day, if the hedge fund managers, the financial people, the marketing executives, the advertising executives, all those zealots, business service executives, if they all stop work, would we notice? We would not notice. But if the rest of us stop work, people who actually produce value, as Mark says, then we notice very quickly in just a few weeks, not even a year. And that's one of the key lessons you can learn from this lockdown. And the lockdown is heavy. Here is a figure from the IMF, which reckons that the cumulative output loss between the bottom of this uh, slump, which we're heading into in the in the summer of this year, and perhaps the recovery after that will be at least $9 trillion or 10% of global GDP. Lost forever, that a red bit there is lost forever. It's not coming back. It's you dig a hole in the ground, but you can't fill it up in the economy. It's gone forever. And that loss is of employment resources and people's livelihoods in that red block. Even for the first time, we can now say that this year, the so-called emerging markets, which include in this graph India and China, will see a slump for the first time since records began for emerging economies. There are loads of emerging economies that aren't emerging at all, they're extremely poor. But if you, China and India are the great examples of emerging economies going forward, and uh, usually they keep that uh, growth rate, as we can see in the blue line, in the plus column. If you take out China and India, then emerging market growth is very weak. But including them now, in 2020, there will be a slump for the first time. Billions are losing incomes. According to the International Labour Organization, over 2 billion people, mostly in informal economies, short-term contracts and so on, are going to suffer a huge loss in their wages during the months of these lockdowns and the crisis. More than half a billion people are going to go back into poverty using the poverty measure of the Oxford level of $5.50 a day, which is a high one compared to the World Bank. But we're going to see a huge loss of people making that level now and heading back into poverty as a result of this collapse. And if we come into countries like the UK, this is the UK, only half of workers now are actually at work uh, or they're being furloughed or their employers have temporarily or permanently closed. The businesses have temporarily closed. Turnover has been reduced in others. And really, a high percentage of businesses, over 65%, are either closed or not making a sufficient money to make themselves a function. And most households in the UK now have lost huge amounts of money, even in this short time, reduced income, 70% claiming they've lost income. And if you go down the list, we know that there are even people who cannot afford to pay even basic bills at the moment. And so this huge uh, GDP decline which is going to hit the major economies of the world, like the US, uh, continues for some, ahead, some, some time ahead. Now, I want to ask, what, uh, what's going to happen now? Is this all going to be over by the end of this year? As many people uh, in the stock market, American uh, leadership and Britain claim it will snap back by the end of the year once the lockdowns are over. Well, I would say that's very unlikely. For what first reason is that capitalism was already teetering on a recession before the pandemic hit. Um, growth had already been reduced to very low levels. Europe was in recession. Uh, Japan was in recession. 
Uh, the US was slowing down fast. The UK was in recession before this uh, virus hit. And the main reason, in my view, was a significant slowdown in profitability for capital across the board. This graph shows the situation for the G7 on profitability. And you can see that uh, there, we were at a period of generally depressed profit rates for some time, despite uh, short booms. The Great Recession has taken that down. And now this, uh, we were not really, not, the capitalism is not really seeing uh, a, re a revival in profitability. And profitability is key to capital investment and of overall faster growth and employment for everybody. So in my view, uh, capitalism was already on the edge. This uh, COVID epidemic has driven it over the edge and down the cliff much quicker than perhaps we could expect and certainly much deeper. There will be no return to normal. Uh, here's a, an indication of the trend we've seen since the Great Recession in growth in the US, the dark blue line, growing at that sort of rate. Then we got to the Great Recession in 2008-9, and the trend recovery has been very weak. So this showed that before we even got to COVID, uh, the US economy was growing at a much lower trend growth rate than we've seen before. And the estimate now from Resolution Foundation, amongst others, is that um, we, and the, we can see that with this COVID collapse, and the, given the experience of past recessions, we're likely to see a 14% drop, at least, in UK GDP uh, during the uh, slump that's now underway. And more than that, we will never, ever return, UK economy will never, ever return to the pre-crisis trend that it had uh, before the Great Recession and since. This is a disaster that cannot be uh, reversed. That's an indication of how serious it is, how feeble and failing uh, the capitalist economies and the major economies, if you will. So I'll finish on this chair. There are some lessons. These are some lessons that we want to think about. First, this didn't come out of the sky. It wasn't an asteroid out of the sky. It wasn't some sort of thunderbolt or shock that we could not have known about. Capitalism has been generating these sorts of crises for some time with environmental pollution, industrial farming, climate change, and the way in which it has allowed through these measures, uh, these pa pathogens to enter the human body. Uh, there are more pandemics to come, and maybe a second wave on this particular one before we can control it. So uh, the first thing to be clear is if the virus did not cause this slump, uh, the way in which we organize our society internationally caused this slump, leading to the virus, as you were, uh, striking back. And also we learned that the market doesn't work by privatizing health services, decimating health systems, cutting back public services to the minimum, uh, not being uh, having the, the sort of organized, uh, planned uh, intervention that health systems need to deal with such crises where there's been, on the whole, total chaos in many governments and a failure to act. But in the end, uh, private health systems have had to give up and hand over to governments to try and intervene and direct. The market is not working. And also, this crisis is exposed whose workers are the most important and whose aren't. Who would we rely on in this system rather than uh, uh, the people I mentioned before? We're told that the world's billionaires are very important people, but the result is, of course, that they play no role whatsoever in helping this crisis. It's ordinary people on uh, one millionth of what uh, Jeff Bezos is earning every day who are holding up of making this, uh, dealing with the health crisis and also helping to keep the uh, whole system going at some level. The failure of private health and big pharma, by the way, 15 out of 18 US pharmaceutical companies spend no money whatsoever researching on vaccines or anything to do with viruses. They spend their, most of their time looking for tranquilizers, uh, methods to deal with uh, people's depressions and so on, rather than these issues. So we have uh, uh, pharma has failed, private health care has failed. We need a public health care system which invests in research and production of medicines and vaccines throughout the world, free at the point of use. What, what bigger lesson can the labor movement push in the, in the, into the minds of people across this country and the world but the need for free public health care and a proper health care system properly funded? Instead of bailing out big business, this is what the US and the UK government are doing, we need to take over those sectors of big business that have failed and bring them into a planning system. Because otherwise, we are not going to return to normal. It's not going to be possible to 
revive the economy in an effective way and restore people's jobs at, at previous levels. And in the poor countries, one of the major demands must be to debt, cancel the debt of the poor countries. And now they're piling up more debt and they won't, can't possibly fund that. The IMF and the World Bank are offering dribbles of money to help them. And in no way can that help. We need to demand the cancellation of the debt for these countries. And also to end the huge tax haven uh, shifting of profits, which the big corporations do at the moment, the likes of Amazon, Microsoft, and all the rest, who mostly their profits end up in tax havens rather than in the hands of governments to use for revenues. I just thought the other day, we had Amazon's figure, $10,000 a second Amazon is making at the moment. It's not making much profit anymore because it's had to employ 175,000 more workers and provide safety conditions and raise their wages in order to meet the demand that it's got. That tells you if it didn't raise the wages, you've never raised the wages before, it didn't provide health conditions before, so basically it was exploiting hundreds of thousands of workers to make huge, huge profits. A company on Amazon and broadband companies and social media companies and all the transport companies should be publicly owned as part of the plan so that we can organise society in a way which benefits everybody and not just uh, the profits of the billionaires. So that is the lessons I've learned from this so far. I hope to hear what other people think. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Michael. That was a fascinating. Perfect. Um, we're going to hear from Susan now, who is a professor of economics at the Open University and a counter bio member. Hi there. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Yeah, okay, good. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Michael. Um, that really helped set the scene, I think, for some of what um, I want to say and also help me think through a few points further. I just want to make four points really and I'll tell you what they are before I go through them. Um, the first is to really say something about what how the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the economy is what it's showing up in addition to what we saw in 2007 and 9 and how it's you know sort of changed the terrain of economic policy and debate, the official policy debate, if it were, as it were. Uh, the second thing I wanna talk about, which Michael's already started discussing, is really around labor and how, what this is telling us about what is essential and what work really means and where we need to understand shifts in the way that we all work, which relates much more to the questions of production. And then finally, I want to end on some where we think the new battlegrounds will be for socialists who are organising. And here, really, I want to sort of focus on what will be raging distributional battles around who gets what and how production will be organised in the post-pandemic, or not post-pandemic, as we expect, the post-COVID, shall I say, as pandemics are expected to continue to show their face. So what can I say about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how it's different from 2007 and 9? Well, first of all, it shows up as the structural weakness of the financialized neoliberal economic system and how actually uh, little has changed structurally in spite of what was seen as an unprecedented and historical uh, financial crisis in 2007 and 9. But what it has done quite separately, it has actually massively changed the conditions for capitalism going forward. So what happens next does remain to some uh, extent open and much more open than what came before in 2007-9. We see a huge stretch, well, not huge, but a much wider stretching in the terrain of economic policy and debate. There's, there's going to be much more state intervention. There already is. This has been agreed, you know, this is now uh, seen as, as, as a norm. There'll be much more government debt. This is now also understood. Uh, there'll be questions about how that will be paid, but there's even much more discussion and openness towards the monetization of these deficits. So that rather than the traditional way in which governments raise money, um, there'll be, uh, you know, they'll be drawing upon overdrafts with central banks without the kind of uh, spectre of inflation looming over them. There's even um, talk uh, and discussion, um, and this was in the Financial Times very recently, on uh, putting forward an approach to recovery through controlled inflation. 
these are all hugely distinct and different from the sort of dogmatic neoliberal policy stances that we've seen before. So this has widened the poles of the debate. I mean, even the most right-wing ideologues now, you know, have to say that taxes are going to have to be increased. You know, there has to be more government intervention in, in, in a range of areas. So, so we, we see that train. So the question, you know, so now, of course, the que there are some who are trying to push for austerity already, George Osborne being one of those uh, in, the, in, the, in the period uh, head, uh, ahead of us. And we do need to resist this. But I, I think it's really important to know that where we have to understand as socialists, our terrain and our um, place for opposition and uh, challenge has to go well beyond the austerity, anti-austerity positions um, towards how money is spent, where it is spent and the di distributional implications of that. What also has been, uh, ha this crisis has uh, really shown up is, as Michael has already said, is something really fundamental to, uh, in the, the sort of fundamental relationship in capitalism, that between labour and capital, right? So much has changed in the world of work. What has been considered as essential work? Michael's already said that, stockbroking is not an essential, it's not essential work, it seems. Um, but cleaning in hospitals, municipal workers, um, you know, our, our refuse collectors and recycling crews, these are all essential workers in this moment and they have to continue to work. As well as Amazon warehouse uh, workers, food distribution chains and the like. This really does, you know, show, bring very, very clearly to the fore the massive inequities and structures under which these people are working. They're essential workers, yet they are some of the least well-paid. Um, they're low paid, they work on extremely precarious contracts, zero hours, they've been afforded almost no PPE protection, and, uh, uh, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we've seen some very welcome responses and organization by these workers, the work out of cleaners in the NHS, as well as um, those in Amazon warehouses who have who have um, organized several walkouts and work stoppages. So we see that conflict very, very clearly. You know, these Amazon workers are, are working at, in very, very dire conditions in a, under, under wider lockdown conditions whilst, uh, whilst Jeff Bezos makes enormous amounts of money as, as do many other billionaires. There was an interesting, well, there was a very frightening um, figure that came out of the Institute of Policy Studies in the US that showed in 23 days of pandemic, the rise in wealth of the America's, America's super rich was $287 billion. And that is in the first, in, in 23 days of the pandemic. You know, and, and contrast this to the acute shortages of PPE in the UK, six weeks into lockdown. I mean, these contrasts are very, very stark and they're not things that people can now ignore or somehow argue against and brush under the carpet. So it's very, very clear now from a, a, what is considered essential work that whilst on the one hand we can all speak of essential work as capitalism does not uh, remunerate these workers or value them as if they were essential. Quite the opposite. And we see this across care work and the like. Um, but we do all have to work. We all have to work for a living. We all need income. And in the short term, uh, we can see that this issue of needing an income is now politicized much more further. Um, the pandemic and the lockdown has shown the huge limits uh, of our welfare system, social security. Um, suddenly, you know, self-employed people are shocked at the dire amounts in which people on benefits receive, uh, on which they're expected to live, right? So that, that has really brought this, has politicized the question of income and the need for an income in a context where people are unable to go to work. So one, one issue is what work is essential and the second one is why we need to work in the first place to earn money. So already the, the state has had to intervene very, very uh, intense, you know, much, um, much further than it has uh, for a very long time in, in maintaining people's incomes so they can live. So that, that's not, so, so uh, in the short run, we do need to think about this, particularly since we can expect massive unemployment 
as as we exit lockdown, as as uh, the global economy and the UK economy um, slows down, and uh, as Michael has shown us very alarmingly, cannot recover and resume um, in to to any extent that it where it was to where it was before. So that's that's really um, the second point uh, about labour. And really, you know, and, and also the, we need to think about how work is going to be organized in the future. It will be based upon the expectation of future pandemics. Right. So we need to think very deeply about what that is going to look like. And um, there will be more, you know, digital, there'll be less globalization. So, but what work will we be doing and how how will we be paid? These are these are the questions that as socialists we need to really, really think about. And we uh, and I'll come back to some of the distributional questions of that, because there are many, many uh, possibilities of how this can then pan out. Um, so the third is, is about business, really, the third point and production again. The state has intervened uh, at a very, very great scale to, to support businesses. Now, this business support has been indiscriminate in terms of sectors. You know, um, capitalism and our measures of GDP don't care what we produce, it's how much we produce. So there's been this indiscriminate support for businesses. And um, I think, again, without thinking about what is going to be essential moving forward, uh, both for humanity, what, what meets our needs, as well as what is necessary to avert climate catastrophe. So, so this is another thing where we really can think much more carefully about how we as socialists respond and what we demand. An example of this is food, right? Let's have a, I might say a little bit more about food, the food system. Food is, of course, an extremely essential item. We all need it to survive. But the global food production and distribution system is one of them, it, it is a clear aberration um, in terms of society. You have a small handful of global retailers that control the vast majority of global food supply chains. They're notorious for having push down the conditions and, and payment for developing country uh, primary producers. They've outsourced a massive amount of their production. They've been implicated with some of the massive problems with agriculture in the UK, notably the dairy sector. Um, and, um, and they are extremely wasteful. Capitalist production and distribution of food is, and Marx talks about this actually, uh, way back uh, when when discussing the the commodification of food, you know what happens when the production distribution of food becomes for profit rather than for meeting needs, all sorts of questions around adulteration in the food for the, for the poor in particularly, um, and and other kind of um, aspects of nutritional uh, bias and uneven uh, and uh, inequalities that that result out of that. But in the US, an estimated 30 to 40% of food supply is wasted. This is a hugely polluting, wasteful, uh, unequal um, uh, system of, of, of uh, producing and providing what is an essential item for human life. We've seen in the UK very quickly, um, you know, we have a, an agricultural sector now because of the power of these retailers that cannot survive without flying in hundreds and hundreds of Romanian workers because it has, you know, it has been based upon gang labor for decades. This has, you know, so we, we're in a situation where it's very, very clear that the way in which production is organized, not only in terms of which sex and what is produced, but how does not meet the needs, but does not meet human needs, but has been um, horrifyingly, um, uh, uh, horrifyingly uh, profit uh, related right, and profit driven. So this gives us you know, a very clear starting point um, to really start thinking about the reorganization of production. You know, uh, support to businesses is, cannot be bailouts. It has to be something that pushes 
uh, towards much more worker participation. There's a lot of discussion around placing conditions on bailouts in terms of national ownership, workers' participation. This is all, these are all very, very important uh, demands that we should be making. But we also need to go beyond that to really start pushing towards a much more fundamental and uh, um, a much more fundamental and uh, radical restructure and production, sectors that meet our needs. If oil companies are wanting bailouts, if airlines are wanting bailouts, if auto industries are asking for bailouts, the solution is not a bailout, but government intervention in winding out down and redeploying workers from those industries into ones that meet our needs. In the short term, this also means making sure that people have enough and can uh, can can uh, pay for their own survival and, um, and and livelihoods. Finally, I just want to say in the last minute, um, the what could come about. So these are the demands we have to make. These are the areas and spaces in which quite fundamental and foundational changes are, are, are occurring in the conditions for capitalism to continue, right? The capitalism could continue, and it can continue to resolve some of these major structural problems around production, around which sectors, around work, by becoming uh, much more based on surveillance, intensification of work. It can be based on further racism, misogyny and feminization of the workforce. It can result in a deglobalization that that takes a sort of nationalist form rather than one of solidarity and cooperation and we absolutely have to fight against this similarly in the in in the need for raising taxation we have to absolutely fight against uh, uh, ordinary people taking the brunt here this has to be not only about making corporations pay but moving into a situation where um, the organization of production is sustainable for workers, for people, and for the planet. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Susan. We're going to move on to the uh, Q&A now. So we'll do rounds of three questions, and if panellists could keep answers to about five minutes long, that would be really good. Um, so the first round of questions is, should we be advocating public ownership of essential businesses, and how do we do this without the state taking over? And we have, what room is there for a wave of workers' co-ops? And what alternatives to the banking and monetary system should we be arguing for? So if Michael, you could answer first for about five minutes, that'd be great. Well, um, I think we have to be, if, as uh, Susan has said, uh, we have now a range of businesses which are collapsing, uh, the airlines and others, the oil companies are in deep trouble too. Um, a whole range of service industries are in deep trouble. And, that obviously poses the question of whether they should be bailed out. In the United States, and to some extent in the UK, bailout money is being handed over to these companies without any uh, check, without any accountability. $500 billion is in the hands of President Trump to hand out to whoever he likes uh, to bail out in the United States, as approved by Congress. That's the situation of the solution of the elites in these countries at the moment. Um, we in the labor movement say, well, obviously we need transport services. We need companies to function so that they do that, but we're not going to bail them out. As Susan says, we need to reorganize them. We need to bring them into public ownership so they act as public services, not as uh, profit-making companies for the interests of the owners of those companies and the billionaires that sit on top of them. Now, that does mean state control. Uh, I think the question is getting at the point, are we going to replace one lot of elites of billionaires with a load of bureaucrats controlling the state? Well, in my view, uh, the way that that is done is that workers have to be participating and controlling. Those workers in those industries must have the democratic right to control and organise those industries within the operations uh, that they are in. So uh, that would mean workers' councils or whatever you want to call it, workers' committees, uh, trade union committees operating in conjunction with a left-wing socialist government to organize the planning of those companies and industries in the interests of everybody, both of the workers in those uh, sectors and also of the wider uh, community at large. So that the combination has to be a democratic form of state ownership. And that process lays the basis for um, a new um, development. I think the, 
The other question was, um, if I've got it here, and perhaps Lucy can remind me. Um, it was... Okay. Uh, oh, the other one, Lucy? What room is there for a wave of workers' co-ops? Yeah, well, that's partly the same thing that I've answered there, that workers' co-ops, if you like. Co-ops is slightly different. That is in the smaller businesses. Uh, we could see the need to bring smaller businesses that are collapsing everywhere and perhaps not come back to bring them in with the help of government into cooperative formations so that they can operate on a level where they're providing a service in local communities and they can uh, provide employment for workers and deliver uh, a, situ a, a, level, a, a level of a community service at local level. Um, in the way area that I'm in now, we have a co-op which has just been set up uh, in the course of this pandemic. We're, uh, which is a pretty risky thing to do, but they're attempting to provide a service where many people who are unable to get out uh, cannot uh, get any support or opportunity to get any deliveries. I don't know if you guys are trying to get a delivery from a, a top supermarket uh, at the moment, but when I attempted to do it through, was it Asda? Uh, I even went as far as Waitrose, and uh, all I could get from them was about six weeks ahead to get a delivery slot for anything. So some people are in a desperate situation where they need community help and work with co-ops could play that role. I'll let Susan carry on with the other questions because I forgot. <laughs> I was hoping you would answer the question about banking and monetary system. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll come back to that. What was that question again, Sue? Yeah. I think it was, I think the question was, uh, what, what uh, future monetary and banking system can we envisage? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I'll, I'll well, that's certainly a big point for me. I'll let you come back in first. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't uh, talk about that straight away. Um, yeah, no, I think just carrying on from Michael's point there, you know, I think um, at the moment, actually, there's germs of cooperatives through mutual aid networks that are really starting to grow. And, uh, and I think they can really form the basis of a kind of community-based solidarity uh, kind of economy that help people um, get what they need, food being one of those. Um, so th that's fantastic. And I think we need to really promote that and to see how that can uh, be built upwards. That's a big question that's been had about, you know, should we start with trying to build workers' cooperatives and move upwards? Or it or uh, is a question about kind of nationalization and state-led public ownership feeding down. And the answer really is both need to occur simultaneously in a relation to each other. Um, otherwise co-ops are doomed to fail if they're forced to compete. I think we do need to think about how we're gonna structure society in a way that removes competition, capitalist competition from uh, informing the way in which uh, things are organized, right? So this is really, um, this is really this is really key, I think, and that comes to questions about public transport and other things. I think you know uh, Michael's quite right. It's about workers' participation and workers' democracy and workers' control, um, but also some kind of state oversight. I can imagine, you know, so any kind of reorganisation of the economy really requires an overhaul of democracy as well and how we understand democracy. I mean, given the nature of the British state today, I wouldn't see public ownership as necessarily the answer. I mean, what happened? You know, what stops them from selling it back at a lot? You know, uh, at a loss to the to the taxpayer after profits and regained as they have done with the East Coast Mainline and, and many other former utilities. So we do need to, to, to think about democratic accountability, both at the level of state and as well as the level of production and work. Um, in terms, of, I'm going to let Michael say much more about money and banking, but one thing, you know, what, I guess this is, the, I'm sort of rehashing some, a lot of the discussion that's been had in the wake of 2007-9, but really a lot of that has been um, a question about what role does finance really play? What, what, why do we need finance? What is it for? To what end and why? And, and uh, to put it very uh, briefly, what we've seen is a, a shift from finance and banking or money or some, you know, finance being a servant to production to becoming its master and actually overthrowing it, undermining uh, the productive um, realm of the economy. So, any kind of finance and monetary system that we imagine has to be thought of in relation to that. What money in finance and banking do we actually need in order to support this? So, so we, you know, so uh, 
industrial banks, for example, you know, or uh, government development banks or state banks these are all things that we can start thinking about cooperative banks uh, more saving societies at local levels that fund uh, local production you know there, there's lots of there's lots of models and modes of banking that we can imagine that are related much more to the needs of of ordinary people and not uh, the needs of finance in and of itself can i add to um, that uh, from sue there i mean banking is my bugbear because uh, I go around the labor movement in the last few years, uh, during the period when we had uh, a Corbyn leadership in the Labour Party, and uh, we had a, a real big attempt to tra transform the way in which the economy is run, and particularly the banking sector. And many people come on the platform and say that banking was a the banking system caused the crash of 2008-9, it operates in entirely speculative and reckless manner, uh, the, the chief executives of these banks are earning millions uh, and for what purpose and what sort of a banking system is that and then I would then they would say so the answer is we need to regulate it to make sure they don't they don't do nasty things and that we need to ensure that uh, well, perhaps we should break them up into smaller bits and so on but nobody nobody really pressed the point that seemed to me so obvious that we need to turn banks into a public service. They should be publicly owned and run as a public service, just like the health system or education. And what do I mean by a public service? I don't mean that a public banking system will go out and speculate on the stock market with people's money and their own money, quite the reverse. I think all the speculative activities of banks should be closed down. And that what we want is, what do we want a bank for as ordinary, uh, working people in the labour movement. We want somewhere where, we can, uh, where our money and transactions can take place in reasonable security. And I have to say that many of these big banks, while they're speculating, are mucking up our basic security of looking after our transactions. We need somewhere to, where we have savings. And also we need some uh, uh, an operation by which we can borrow money, perhaps for the purchase of whatever is big ticket items that we can't afford directly. So that applies to small businesses as well. They need working capital. So there's a, there is a role for banking, but it's a public service that provides that in order to wield the, uh, pro provide us with support on a month to month basis in terms of income. Because we're not abolishing money. Money's not abolished. We don't get our goods at the point of uh, delivery free at the moment. I think that's one area we need to move to, to public delivery basic services free to the point of use why we're paying for local transport is beyond me for example all these things are a part of the process but while money exists we need to make that service uh, of banking to deliver the money the money that we require to make the transactions for those small businesses and ourselves and end all the speculation and the way to do that is first to take over the major banks we've got five big ones in the uk they're untouched by the last crisis. They're untouched by this crisis. Nobody's talking about that. And yet they're making a complete hash of delivering money in terms to small businesses and to households as a, uh, in an attempt to get us through this pandemic. It's such an annoying, I get annoyed, really infuriated by the fact, having worked in banking and finance for many decades, to see the disgusting speculative activities that go on and crookery and corruption and we do nothing about it. Thank you um, for that. We have another question, which is quite a long one. Um, so I'll just give you this one. It's, what is the likelihood of China posting growth in the third quarter? And in the concept, context of Trump's increasing anti-China rhetoric, to what extent could that lead to more tensions between them? And more generally, do you think this crisis is likely to increase the threat of new wars? So, Michael, if you want to go first. I'll go down first because on the third quarter bit, I think it's pretty clear that the China will probably be growing by the third quarter. The latest figures we saw on their economic activity in this quarter that we're just entering is that they've just about turned up from the, from the bottom and they're starting to recover. They've probably made the biggest uh, reduction in GDP in the first and this quarter that they've had since 1976, like all the other countries, they've really been hit uh, by the pandemic and the lockdown. But they're, because they managed to get their lockdown under uh, successfully control 
uh, the number of cases and deaths fairly quickly, 76 days it took them, uh, now they're in a position where they can begin to recover. But when I look at the data, I can see that while services are coming back in China, the ability of Chinese manufacturers to sell anything is not coming back because there's nobody to sell to. Everybody else is still locked down. Manufacturing exports are then therefore weakened. But I think China will move back into positive territory and probably end the year over the whole year of growing by between 1% and 3%, which is appalling by Chinese standards, but at least it's a plus, unlike any other country. And the questioner is absolutely right that what this pandemic and the lockdown and the slump is bringing forward is an increased and intense battle that's now going to take place between the United States in particular and China. First to blame China for the uh, virus, to blame China for the spread of the virus, to blame China for everything, and in order to try and impose tariffs on trade and technology and restrict China from becoming a rising economic and technology power around the world. This is going to be the main battle of the next 10 or 15 years on a geopolitical level between a relatively declining in, uh, leading imperialist power in the United States and a rising economic power, China. We know it's been coming, but I think this uh, slump and pandemic is going to intensify that rivalry. Will it lead to war? Well, I think not. I think more likely it will lead to a collapse in globalization and uh, trade. It will lead to maybe mini wars around the world, proxy wars in various regions, with both sides taking a side a bit like used to happen between the Soviet Union and the US uh, in the past. That's the sort of position that we're coming forward. And uh, this is going to be the, the most important geopolitical uh, development and trend that we must understand and see how it's going to develop because it's going to be a big feature in all sorts of things like trade, technology, the environment, and so on. And these two powers are going to be fighting over these issues. Thank you, Michael. Do you want to come into that, Susan? Sure. I mean, um, I agree with Michael. It's very frightening and it's very clear from immediately with the pandemic and the kind of racialized language and divisive language with which uh, Trump has been sort of uh, uh, di discussing uh, China's role has been very, very clear. Um, I want to just sort of make a small sort of sidestep from the question of recovery and growth. Now, 1% is still extremely low growth for China, uh, you know, in this, in the recent history. Um, the world will have to accept low, zero or negative growth for the foreseeable future. The question of recovery is just, it's just, I, I don't, I, I think it's an obsession that we really need to dispel. We don't want recovery. We don't want uh, profit making under capitalist relations to recover based on new reorganizations that are likely going to be much more repressive. We don't want that. We need to. We need to change that. And we need to move beyond the question of of growth completely. There's more than enough out there um, for redistribution. And I think perhaps in a world of zero growth, this can you know the questions of redistribution need to be articulated much more clearly. I don't know how to do that, but there you go. Uh, thank you. That leads quite nicely onto the next question. Um, which I'd still like Michael to answer first, but is it possible to have an economic model which is not dependent on endless growth? Um, what would it look like and could it deal with reducing inequality and economic destruction? Well, I think this is a big question, Lucy, and I'm sure the viewers on this are probably unsure about this question. It's a big debate. Um, do we go on growing forever is the cry? And what is the point of growth if it's destroying nature, causing pollution and environment around the world? increasing inequalities, uh, creating conditions where eventually, with climate change and global warming, you might extinct the whole planet. Uh, is this the way that we must continue? Well, the answer is no, we cannot possibly continue along those lines. We've, but what we remember before the virus, what was the issue? It was global warming and climate change, and the fact that scientists were telling us, if we don't do something about controlling greenhouse gases and carbon emissions, within a very short period of time, if it's not too late, if we don't force them down, then we will position where millions of people will be facing 
uh, hunger, floods, earthquakes, droughts, and all kinds of other things that will develop it, it causing chaos in the planet. And that there's no possibility of the planet surviving in any reasonable condition by the end of this century unless we do something about it. We mustn't forget that issue. The, person, the idea of just growth as such as something, of course, uh, is not, doesn't answer this question because if it means growth with fossil fuel production, if it means growth with uh, more logging, more uh, uh, mineral resource extraction, uh, non-stop throughout the world, then that is going to be a disaster, not only for the nature, but also for human beings in general going forward. So what we need is to meet people's needs, and there are still billions of people on the barest minimum of living conditions, and, and as I've just argued earlier, there'll be more of them now as a result of this, and many people are at a level of, of uh, food starvation, not just at barest minimum conditions, and we need to raise billions of people out of poverty, give them a decent life, give them a future, give them an education, give their children and their relatives an opportunity in life, and we need so in that sense, we need to provide the resources to do that. If that means growth, that's growth in a different sense, uh, meeting the population's demands. But we need to organize that in a way that's in harmony with the environment and with nature. In my view, that is possible. There is a big debate about this. Uh, some people say that's not possible. The only way we can do that is to cut population, is to stop growing, is to reverse things. My argument is that there's lots of things we can reverse, as Sue has mentioned, excessive waste consumption around the world between capitalists. Tremendous waste. Capitalist system is totally wasteful. It's really inefficient. It's very efficient to some extent in raising profits, but it's not efficient in delivering the needs of people and doing it in a most organized and economical way in the real meaning of the word economical. And I think that that is a task of a social plan, a socialist alternative. And I think it is possible that we can meet the needs of the population without destroying nature. Yet it's an issue that we will continue to debate in the movement uh, over the next few years. But this pandemic demonstrates to us that we have to come to a clear way of dealing with this. And the Labour movement has to adopt a determined plan to achieve this because otherwise the future of the human race, let alone the billions in, uh, in uh, poverty and difficulty at the moment, is under threat in the next few decades. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Michael there as well. Um, on the question of growth, I think it's interesting uh, to go back and think about what growth measures. So when uh, politicians, economists talk about growth, they're talking about GDP. GDP does not mention what's produced, really. You know, things like finance and insurance, are, are added to GDP, but what value do they really add to our daily lives? They measure growth in wealth. It doesn't measure growth in, in, uh, in, in humanity in terms of raising people out of poverty, etc. So growth is itself just both as a concept and its measurement and what it really means and implies, I think really need to be taken to task. It should not be what we're aiming for. Um, it may be that the economy grows by any kind of measure, but really ultimately um, the economy has to be reorganized in a way that's about meeting human needs um, rather and not for profit or exchange. Um, and this will require coordination, cooperation across uh, national borders um, as well as as much more kind of local activity as well and 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 that that's 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 a big task so I think so I wasn't very clear there but I think that it's really absolutely important that we we have to stop thinking about growth and we have to really think about growth could or may or may not be the side effect of meeting the needs of nature and humanity growth is not the end itself Thank you. Okay, we have one final question, which is two, two pronged. Um, does this crisis create opportunities for the working class in terms of developing consciousness? And how do you think we can present a socialist alternative at this moment? What are the priorities to organise around? So, my... Who's first, Lucy? Uh, you, Michael. Okay. Uh... Right, um, I'm sorry, I've seen all the questions on q and I apologise to those people that we haven't been able to deal with them all. 
some of the questions require a whole subject, a whole session on its own, like why does money exist? I'm not sure I could answer that in about one in 30 seconds, but uh, uh, let's deal with this very important question, this last question. I, over all the discussions I've had with people, both in Zooms and other places and discussions uh, on social media, and talking to people during this pandemic, two things come out for me for the Labour movement to look at. The first thing is defensive. I think that when this pandemic's over and this lockdown is over and people go back to work, the employers and the owners of big companies and small companies are going to try to drive down the living conditions and uh, wages and conditions of workers when they go back to work. They're going to try and say, look, it's terrible, the situation is terrible, we can't possibly pay you what we had before, uh, we need, you, you're going to have to work under different conditions, uh, we're not going to be able to provide all the extra things that you expected and benefits, we want you to, we need to reduce wage costs and you're going to have to pay. So the first thing is going to be a defensive struggle in the workplace to even retain the previous conditions that workers have had across the board and their jobs because many people are not going to get their jobs back uh, over the next year, two years, maybe three years. I'm just looking at some data. I think it's quite likely that some people who are now unemployed will not see another job for three years. So this is the situation. That's a defensive struggle. It's getting jobs back, preserving the conditions, not being forced into worse conditions. That's the job of the trade unions and the labor movement and organization. There. The offensive side for the labor movement, I think there is one for a change, is that how can any government stop a political campaign for a fully funded health system which meets the needs of the people and deals with future pandemics and other crises like that? How can they talk about privatizing and cutting the health system anymore? They may well try to, but how can they talk about and expect to get support when we, we could mobilize on this issue above all? I mean, the labor movement can come out of this and say, look, we want the UK national health system to be fully funded to provide the services it needs, to stop cutting nurses' pay, stop entering their positions, reboost the people who have to work in the industry, uh, stop the marketization of the NHS, turn it into a system which can meet the people's needs. And the health question is going to be international. It's not just going to be the question of the NHS here, but elsewhere. It seems to me a powerful... Uh, raising of the consciousness of working people to see that public services matter. Government, government services matter. They're not bad. They're good. We need more of them. We need them properly funded. Thank you. Uh, Susan, do you want to follow up? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've already started a uh, scene where, where uh, pressure is being applied and where it needs to be amplified much, much more. And in, in the first instance, it's been around uh, access to safety equipment um, for, for frontline and key workers. And, and this is being ramped up to the question of uh, pay for nurses, pay for carers, as well as uh, questions around student debt bursaries and educational financing so all of this needs to be ramped up and joined up much much further and i think you know if the the more that all of us can see that uh we are workers and uh, engaged in in the same kinds of labor capital relations i.e you know when we go back to work and our bosses want to lower our wages that we can feel as bold as the nurses have done going out on what was it westminster bridge you know that 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 people can that can increasingly um join together in that way. I think absolutely around work, around schools, around our education is another area of this. The questions around what is education for? Is it really for producing another workforce that does a load of rubbish jobs that aren't necessary for anything? Or is it for building a different kind of society? I think we're in a situation where we're really able to question what our education's for and, and the lives of our children and the young people um, as, as, as they, you know, as they mature into whatever world is ahead of us. Um, um, all of these are really important. I think also, I think really importantly, we need to push at the local, at the sort of municipal level for greater democratic um, participation. So a lot of the big problems facing local authorities currently, you know, even things like fl issues of fly tipping 
and abilities for local authorities to respond have been massively, um, uh, ha have been hugely depleted because of austerity and the cuts that have taken place ahead of time. So I think in order to be able to mobilize much more on this local level right now uh, is a really important part of, of where we should be, you know, fighting these battles. Yeah, and of course in anti-war, anti-imperialist um, grounds as well. Uh, thank you for that. Um, sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. We tried to cover as uh, many as, as possible. Uh, both speakers now have three minutes each to sum up, make final um, final thoughts, and um, yeah, summing up. So my yeah, I haven't got much to say because I um, because I think we've covered quite a bit of it, and obviously the questions that we haven't answered is very difficult to answer in three minutes. I just all I say is that we need more discussion on this. People need to keep their eyes on what's going on with the virus, what governments are doing, and uh, uh, we need to keep an eye too on what's happening to people's livelihoods and jobs coming out of this and how we need to organise. It's going to be, this is just, we're not even at the worst level of this slump. That's what I want to emphasise to people now. This is just, this next few months are going to be poorly. There's going to be 25, 30% unemployment rates in the major economies. This is a staggering number of people leaving aside the developing economies that Sue has talked about, where we exceed even more unemployment. This is, this is just way beyond anything we've seen before. The hope that this is going to be short term is the view of our leaders and of Wall Street and of the, the mainstream economic uh, policy makers. Well, I don't think that's going to be the case. It's going to be dragged out over a long time and it could be seriously damaging permanently for millions of people. So uh, this, is, this is not something that's just going to disappear by this time next year when the sun comes out and we've forgotten all about it. This is going to be dragging on for some time. And that even assumes that there is no second wave of this virus as we come out of the lockdown, which is quite a possibility. So uh, this is something we really need to understand and to use the opportunity to, as socialists in the labor movement, to try and bring to the consciousness of working people that there is an alternative. We didn't have to get into this mess and we can get out of it in a different way. Yeah, I'd like to sum up just by saying that uh, if you're not already a member of Counterfire, then uh, please do join. I think a really important part of um, of educating ourselves and also to keep pushing this is, as Michael said, we need to understand that we're in it for the long haul and to keep uh, pressing uh, for resistance in the right places um, uh, together. What I didn't mention also is, is anti-racism. I think that's an area that we really absolutely have to continue to push that. And it's what's been happening um, uh, in, in light of the pandemic have really, really highlighted um, the racialized nature of capitalism and, and we need to oppose that uh, deeply. Um, so that's, yeah, so we have to keep going. We have to keep going and, and pushing for, for an alternative um, and uh, not very hard hitting, sorry. <laughs> I'm running out of steam. It's hard hitting enough, Sue. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's it from our panellists. Thank you so much for, uh, for speaking for us. It was really fascinating to hear from you. Um, I've just